Well, I can, I'm sure you can tell that I'm in a different circumstance, situation, location today. And uh, that's because the, the worship center at Calvary is still under construction. There's a lot of things being done. And so what I'm doing is uh, going to just talk with you a little bit today from my office uh, here in Tuscumbia, where I do journey reentry ministries. So I hope it won't be too much of a distraction uh, seeing things a little bit different. I will tell you that I've got a glare on my screen, so I'm having to kind of uh, look around and pass that. I hope it won't be too much of a distraction for me. But if you would, take your Bible and turn to the book of Mark, uh, chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading in verse 14. Mark, chapter 6, verse 14. Here's what is written. King Herod heard of it. He's talking about the, the miracles of Jesus from last week that we looked at. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. And that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah. And others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John whom I beheaded has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias has a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. For, fear of Herod, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. Let's take a moment and ask God to bless this time together. Father God, I thank you that through technology that uh, your word is proclaimed. I ask that those who may be uh, watching this will be encouraged and God, help me to speak only those words that are true and from you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now, you remember, um, this is a passage of Scripture that is being dictated by Peter, probably to Mark, who is his um, dictation secretary, I guess you could say. And when you're reading through the book of Mark, this really kind of seems out of place. But in reality, it's not this story about John the Baptist, because what is going on is that uh, it's, it's Peter's recounting of what happens when a person follows Christ. Now, John the Baptist is a model for us. And the reason uh, could be because of what Paul wrote over in 2 Timothy. He wrote in 2 Timothy 3.12 these words. Now, take them serious. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Last week was about being more like Jesus. It was about living godly lives of mercy, love, grace, forgiveness, all those things. But I want to make it very clear that if, when you live for Jesus, there's going to be blowback. There are going to be repercussions. There are going, there's going to be persecution. And, and what, what we're finding here is a description of John the Baptist, how he followed Christ, and what it got him, and what we need to be willing to expect ourselves. Now, Paul also describes what happened to him because he was a follower of Christ. He said, and this is in 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 24, he received 39 lashes five times. He was beaten with rods three times, stoned. He was shipwrecked, adrift at sea, endangered from rivers, robbers, Jews, Gentiles, in cities, in the wilderness, at sea, from false Christians. He had many sleepless nights, hungry and thirsty, and often exposed to the cold. Now, it was because Paul lived this way for Christ, proclaiming the gospel, that he endured the things that we see here. That's why he wrote, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So it's a good chance that Paul wrote that because he knew what had happened to John the Baptist. 
he would he may have even been at the celebration that we're about to talk about but let, let's back up and and let's learn a little bit about John the Baptist because he's coming in uh, in a unusual way here in the narrative of Mark chapter 6. Now John the Baptist's birth was revealed by Gabriel. He was devoted by his parents to God from birth as a Nazarite. And what a Nazarite's vows were is that they would not drink alcohol, they would not cut their hair, and they would not touch dead bodies. The scripture also teaches us that John the Baptist was saved while he was yet in his mother's womb. This comes from Luke chapter 1 and verse 15, where it says that he was filled with the Spirit while in his mother's womb. Being filled with the womb. Um, being filled with the Spirit is the, the very definition of salvation. He was also Jesus' cousin, and his call was to herald the Messiah's arrival as Elijah, symbolically. Now, what John the Baptist did is he pointed people to Jesus. He lived in the desert. He had a, a, a garment of, of camel hair. He had a belt, and he ate honey and, and locusts. So, I mean, he was an austere uh, way of living. One day when he was uh, preaching, of course, his message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. One day where he was baptizing, uh, because there was much water there, what is uh, found in the scripture, is that Jesus came to be baptized as an example for all of his followers. And so when Jesus came up from the water, the heavens opened, the spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove, something like a dove, we don't know exactly what it was, and the voice of God spoke from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is one of the few times in all of scripture where the Trinity appears together. And so that's a little note that we must find. Now, as Jesus began his ministry, John the Baptist made a point of saying, he must increase, but I must decrease. And so what we find is that really not much else is written about John the Baptist. So in Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 29, we didn't read the whole passage, Peter describes what happened to John the Baptist while he was in prison. Because what had happened is Herod had heard of Jesus' miracles. And, and he thought that this was John the Baptist that had come back from the dead. Well, this kind of jumps out at us. So uh, we get the story of what happened and the reason he was in prison, because John the Baptist had condemned Herod for marrying his brother's wife. And as a result of that, Herodias got angry with him, and she wanted John the Baptist dead. But what is interesting is that Herod loved to listen to John the Baptist. He believed him to be a holy and godly man, and he listened to him gladly, but he was perplexed. And even though he heard him gladly, he didn't become a believer. Now, let me give you a little thought right here at the side. It is possible to be interested in God, in the scripture, in the things of God, even to the point of hearing the gospel and still not believe and still not come to Christ for salvation. Something very similar happened in the 1700s when uh, um, George Whitfield came and would preach in the open air in the colonies. And uh, it is said that Benjamin Franklin loved to listen to him preach, but he didn't become a believer. He never actually believed in Christ. Now, what happens with John the Baptist being in prison is that, and we get this from Matthew chapter 11, John the Baptist sent some of his uh, followers to Jesus because John the Baptist is in prison. He knows he's about to be decapitated. He knows he's going to lose his life. And apparently John the Baptist had some doubts. And so he sent some of his followers to Jesus and they told, he said, I want you to ask him this. Are you the one who is to come or should we look for somebody else? Now, John the Baptist knew Jesus very well, and yet he came to a time of doubt in his life. I can imagine him 
thinking of something maybe similar to this. You know, if he is not the Messiah, if he's not the one we've been looking for, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to recount everything I said, and I'm getting out of Dodge. I'm leaving. But if he is the one, if he is the Messiah, I'm all in. And so what we find is that Jesus responds to the question from, uh, the, from John the Baptist's followers, and this is found in Matthew 11, verses 4 through 6. Jesus said this, Go and tell John what you hear. What, notice that what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And then he, then he adds a little tag right there on, in verse 6. Jesus says, Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So they take this message back to, Jesus, back to John the Baptist. He heard it. And he said, he is the one, I'm all in, and it cost him. Now, I want you to hear that. It cost John the Baptist to be a follower of Christ. Now, the way his death came about was this. There was a big party, Herod had thrown a big party, invited all these important people. Of course, his wife was there. And his wife's daughter uh, danced for King Herod. Now, I don't know what kind of dance she did, but... You know, apparently it pleased Herod, and he may have uh, had a little few too many um, adult beverages, and he made an off-the-cuff statement because he was so pleased. He said, I will give you anything you ask up to one half of my kingdom. Well, the daughter goes to her mother, Herodias, and says, what do I ask for? And without, without even hesitating, she said, John the Baptist's head on a platter. So the daughter goes back tells Herod what she wanted. And because Herod didn't want to look bad in front of all his guests, he fulfilled the request. That's how John the Baptist died. Let's stop a minute and let's back up. Let's think through this some. Now, who was John the Baptist again? He was Jesus's cousin. Did John the Baptist live a holy and godly life? Yes, he was a Nazarite from birth. Was John the Baptist called by God? Again, the answer is yes. Was John the Baptist a believer? Again, the answer was yes. John the Baptist was anxious about what it was costing him to follow, to follow Jesus until he got that answer. And I wanted you to remember his question of Jesus. Are you the one or do we look for someone else? Well, Jesus says, yes, tell them what you've seen. And when John the Baptist heard all of that, he knew that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, a couple more questions. Could Jesus have prevented John the Baptist execution? He's a son of God, God himself. Yes, he could have prevented it. Did Jesus prevent John the Baptist's execution? The answer is no, he didn't. Are those things that Jesus didn't do, didn't deliver him, didn't stop the execution, are those any proof that Jesus did not love John the Baptist? The answer is no. In fact, we need to be careful that we have a clear understanding of the expression of God's love for us. It is not what God does or doesn't do in answer to our questions or even our prayer. The proof of God's love for us is the cross. That is the proof that God loves. Just because our life may be hard does not mean God doesn't love us or care about us. And Jesus does not hide that fact that being a follower of his brings about adversity, difficulty, and hardship, even to the point of, of, of a person's life being taken. That's what happened with John the Baptist. 
Now, now listen to some things Jesus said about following him and how honest he was about being a follower in the world. In John 15, 20, here's what Jesus said. Remember the word I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Matthew 24, 9, Jesus said, They will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Luke 10, 3, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. The picture of that is, is amazing. Luke 21, 12. They will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. So Jesus was very clear. He did not say that if you follow me, you can name it and claim it, that if you have a seed gift and God's going to pay you back tenfold, he has not promised uh, to deliver us from adversity, hardship, or difficulty. What he has promised to do is to never leave nor forsake us and that our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. In fact, the apostles, when they came back after performing miracles and casting out demons, they told Jesus, said, man, this is great. I mean, even the demons obey us. And Jesus said, wait a minute, guys. You're getting excited because you healed a few people and, and cast out some demons? If you want to really rejoice about something, rejoice that your name is written in heaven. <laughs> it's getting a perspective in life of what it means to follow Christ and what we can expect, and Christ was very straightforward with us. The words of Jesus, though, were not just for the first century. I I'll tell you that. In fact, ever since Jesus, the time of Jesus in the first century, Christians have been persecuted to greater and lesser degrees ever since then. Christians are being literally killed in countries, Muslim countries, all across the world right now. And there are all different kinds of persecutions and adversity. So the thing that we are being told here in the book of Mark is that when you follow Christ, there will be a cost. But the cost is always worth it. Let me tell you a little story about a man by the name of Lewis Drummond. He was uh, my field supervisor when I was doing my, my work at Beeson. And uh, one day he was teaching a class. And uh, there's just 10 of us in the class. And Dr. Drummond asked this 10 preachers amongst us. We all had been in ministry more than five, some 10 years or more. And Dr. Drummond asked this question. He said, gentlemen, what if God told you that in the space of one year, he was going to use you to be the catalyst of a nationwide revival. That thousands upon thousands of people would come to Christ for salvation. Families would be healed. People delivered from, from alcoholism and drug use. Uh, the, nation, the prisons would empty all because of the direct result of God using you to bring revival and awakening to the United States of America. But at the end of those, at the end of that year, you would be physically, emotionally, and psychologically broken. You would not be able to get out of a wheelchair. All of your family and your friends will have abandoned you. And you are left to sit by yourself in a small room in a nursing home for the rest of your days. Would you take it? Take God up on his offer. There was one Church of God pastor because the room got silent. It, it got quiet. All of us Baptist preacher boys were kind of sitting there looking at each other with our heads you know, down a little bit. But this one Church of God pastor, it was so wonderful. He, he, he said, even so, come Lord Jesus. Yes, praise God. And so I wonder... Are we, willing, are we willing to pay the price that it comes to be a follower of Christ? It's easy to listen to a message on YouTube. You can turn it off anytime you want to. Not, don't do that now, but 
if you wanted to, you could turn it off or pause it. It's pretty easy for me to sit here and, and do this Bible study, this, this message. The rub comes is when our faith clashes with a society that hates Christ and Christianity. What will we do then? Well, that's not going to happen in America. Well, you know what? It just might someday. Who knows with the climate the way it is across our nation, what might happen in five or 10 or even 15 years or next week. Who knows? So I want us to understand something that goes a little bit further because I, you know, this message so far has been kind of down. I mean, it hasn't been the most upbeat. It hasn't been the most positive that you can imagine. Even though those who uh, are persecuted for Christ get a special reward in heaven. Well, that's in the book of the Revelation. Didn't have time to, to put this in the message. But I want to tell you what is also a promise from Christ that is described by the Apostle Paul. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want to pick up reading in verse 3 because I want us to see the difference that Christ makes in a believer's life in the midst of hardship and difficulty. In fact, you know, if a person asks, why does God let bad things happen to good people? You know, why is it that the best person I ever knew got cancer and died a horrible death? Well, you know, one of the reasons could be is for that believer to show the world the difference Christ makes when they have adversity, hardship, difficulty, and trouble in life. But let me read to you what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians for the one who is suffering. 2 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 3, one of my favorite passages. He writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort others with the comfort by which we have been comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, Paul's talking about himself and those with him, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. See, that's the example that, that they see, the difference Christ makes. So through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently, catch this, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. So kind of pull all this down, distill it, and bring it to a close. Why do we suffer as a result of following Christ? I would suggest, from what we just read, it's to experience God's comfort personally, individually, in reality, in the body, in the flesh, so that we can encourage others who are struggling and show the world the difference that Christ makes. That's what John the Baptist did. That's what Paul did. That's what believers since the time of Christ and his ascension to heaven, that's what Christians have done. That's what Christians do. Following God will bring suffering. It will bring difficulty. There will be hardship. Let me tell you something. One day, it is all going to be worth it because we'll draw our last breath unless Jesus comes back first. And when we draw our last breath, do you know what we're going to see? At least two angels come and escort us through the valley of the shadow of death so we fear no evil into the very presence of God where he himself welcomes us. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Guys, this world is, is, is broken. This world is what we have to live in. It's a tent. But one day we're going to put this tent off. And what we're trying to do, what we're all trying to do, is, that, is, is for when we stand before God Almighty himself, 
for him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest of your Lord. See, that's what we're looking for. We don't, I mean, if, if there are no streets of gold, I don't care. If there are no crowns, it doesn't matter. If I don't have a big mansion, who gives a care? It's a, no big deal. What matters is that I get to be in the presence of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I'll be glad if my family's there. I pray they all will be. But what makes heaven heaven is the presence of the one who died on the cross for my name to be written in the Lamb's book of life. My prayer for you, friend, is that you too will trust Christ and that you'll have a heavenly perspective and that when you get persecuted for standing for Christ and doing the right thing or not doing the evil thing and there's blowback on it, that you can say, even so come Lord Jesus. You can rejoice because you know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. John the Baptist lived a difficult life but now he is in heaven. He is being glorified because of his faith, and he stayed true in the midst of adversity. Be strong, my brothers and sisters. Don't let the adversary win because he is already defeated. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the, the life of John the Baptist. Thank you for showing us the way his life has made a difference in the lives of others through his faith in you. Thank you that you do not throw us out when we have times of doubt, but that you affirm and confirm us and that we are given strength by your Holy Spirit to live for your glory, however many days it may be, in whatever situation it may be. God, we love you because you first loved us. In Christ's name, amen.